hearts and produce an abundant harvest. Yes. And every person here, and every home represented here, and every need present here this night, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I just lost everything here. Bear with me. This isn't fun. Check your phone and see if we're on. Doesn't tell me. Oh yeah, it does. Somebody's somebody's watching from Africa right now, saying Scott doesn't even know if he's on. <laughs> we're on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. The Lord gave me a word to share, and it's not meant to be a harsh word. It's actually meant to be an encouraging word. And I wanted to start out by saying that because I don't want people to take this the wrong way. But the title of the message is Unbelieving Believers. You know, I saw something on, uh, I don't know, somewhere, maybe on Facebook or something the other day. And, and uh, I thought it was a very interesting statement. And it said that uh, a person isn't a Christian just because they go to church. And I thought about it. And I thought, you know what? It showed a whole bunch of people sitting there and who's looking at their phones and you know, who's got their arm around their girlfriend. And, you know, just because you walk into the building doesn't make you uh, a, a real believer. And, you know, unfortunately, there are many seats in many churches that are occupied by what we can only term as unbelieving believers. And I'll explain as we go. Last week, for instance, I spoke... Uh, about the father of the boy possessed with a demon. Uh, it was in Matthew chapter 9. And, and he had taken his son to the disciples for help. Um, and they could do nothing for him. So he then asked Jesus. He said to Jesus, help us if you can. And that's in Matthew 9 and 22. And Jesus then referred to them all, including the disciples, as faithless people. Jesus told the Father then that anything is possible if a person believes. Amen. Anything is possible. Thank you, Lord. In verse 24, the Father then replied, Oh, I, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. <laughs> you see, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But he wasn't fully convinced that Jesus had the ability to heal his son. I say he knew that he was the Messiah because he went to him. Knowing that he was in a greater position of authority than his disciples who were incapable of helping him. So the mere fact that he went to him reveals that he knew that Jesus was the Son of God or the, the Messiah. He just didn't believe. He wasn't convinced that Jesus could heal that boy. That's why he said, help us if you can. Jesus replied, if I can? I thought they love it. You see, this proves that somebody can be an unbelieving believer. The father wouldn't have gone to Jesus had he not at least had that level of faith. Now, my wife and I, we, we know firsthand what unbelieving believers look like. We, we were raised up spiritually in a faith ministry. It was great. We had visitors. that We had Charles Capps coming into the church. We had um, Jesse Duplantis. We... Jerry Seville, um, the, the other guy that, that oh, there were so many uh, huge names. David Nunn, um, who, who was the man from uh, Lester Summerall. He used to travel with Smith Wigglesworth. I mean, these guys, this is who we were nurtured by, these, these kind of people. The 
That in some people's eyes was a positive, but in many other people's eyes, it was a negative. We were those faith people. They preached that faith message. And you know, it's hard to, for me anyway, it's hard for me to kind of get my mind around that. You know, the, the word tells us without faith, we can't please God. So are they settling for being unpleasing to God? And, and the word tells us that by faith, we receive the promises. So are, are, are they willing to settle for not receiving the promises? I, I've got some thoughts on this tonight that I'm going to share with you. We, we were taught faith. We then preached faith. But we were criticized, not only by unbelieving believers, but by some pastors. I remember once we reached out to someone to connect us with a denomination, and they didn't want to talk to us because we preached a faith message. I, 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 it still got me scratching my head, and there's really nothing wrong with my scalp. <laughs> Friends, just being a textbook Christian will leave you empty and powerless. When I say textbook, I'm talking about a Bible. That's a believer's textbook. That's our handbook. Amen. Or even a person that's taken a couple of courses somewhere. That, that doesn't make you a bona fide believer. It, it, you, if all you have is what, what's written without life application, you're walking away empty. Amen. There has to be a life application Amen. of God's word for it to truly impact your destiny. Listen. You can go to an airport and you can sign up for a course in skydiving. But if you never jump out of a plane, you have no right to go around telling people you're a skydiver. Does that make sense? You're not a skydiver. You took an introductory course in skydiving. You can read the book, but if you don't trust in what's called drag force, that's what makes a parachute prevent you from going splat on the ground. The drag force changes the effect of gravity on you. A lack of trust will leave you frozen in fear in the door of the plane. I mean, I've seen on Seinfeld, you know, where he's frozen in fear in the door of the plane. Cartoons, you see those kind of things. Just because someone took a course, read verses about faith, doesn't make them this faith man or woman, and just because they read about being saved doesn't really make them a Christian yet. It's how they live their life that makes the difference. You see, just reading faith verses, or even sitting in an occasional church service, it doesn't, those things alone will not empower you to move in the gifts of the Spirit. You can know that there is a God, and you can know that there's a Jesus, a Savior. You can know that there's a Holy Spirit. But at the same time, you might not necessarily believe that He's willing and able to heal, to mend, to deliver. Huh? to prosper you. Therefore, it's, it boils down to a lack of trust. You can have head knowledge, but not enough trust in that word for it to impact how you live your life. Friends, a lack of trust in God, a lack of trust in his word will leave you like that person frozen in fear in the door of that plane. 
It'll leave you stuck, unwilling to take that step because you're just not sure. You're more concerned with the consequences of if it doesn't work than you are in believing that it's going to work. You see, for many, they'll only believe in something if they can feel it. A and B. Remember the old slogan, we probably, you may, you may not. The slogan for A and B years ago was seeing is believing at A and B. But you see, we, we don't live in A and B. In the faith world, that's just the opposite. It's not a matter of, of seeing is believing. It's a matter of believing is seeing. What you believe is going to produce so that you're able to see what you were believing for. Are you with me? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 in the Passion really makes this perfectly clear. Listen, faith equips. Faith enables us to operate on a whole different level. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, For we live, for we, us real believers, huh? we live by faith, not by what we see with our eyes. That's what it says in the Passion Translation. Now, keep in mind that even amongst Jesus' disciples, there were unbelieving believers. After Jesus rose and showed himself, revealed himself to his disciples, these events followed. In John 20, beginning of verse 24, and he amplified it, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve disciples who was called Didymus, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciple kept telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the marks of the nails, and put my finger in the nail prints, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside the house, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, though the doors had been barred. He just like came through the wall. Whoosh. Suddenly he's there. He stood among them and he said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, I guess Thomas probably said, Oh man, I hope I get away with this one. Eight days later this happened. Jesus turns to Thomas and he says, Hey, reach here with your finger and see my hands. And put your hand in and place it in my side. Listen to what he said. Do not be unbelieving. That's what he said to Thomas. One of his own disciples. Don't be unbelieving. But stop doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. You see, now all of a sudden he says, Lord Jesus God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, do you now believe? Blessed, happy, spiritually secure, and favored by God are those who did not see me and yet believed. Amen. You see, the life that we're called to live is not to be governed by what we can see. But instead, we've got to hold fast to the truth that what we believe will give substance to what we're hoping for. And then you'll be able to see it. For faith people, this is the truth. This is the way. What we do see with our eyes, listen, is largely a product of what we do believe. For faith people, you're seeing something because you undoubtedly believe for it first. That's how it works. We, you know, we believe for so many things over the years. Don't put any limitations on God. I know I, I, 
told you this story, but maybe you weren't there that day. <laughs> Years ago, I had this Mercedes Benz. I, I worked for Mercedes at the time. And I was on my way to work, and all of a sudden, I felt the car losing power. Well, just as I got to where Sunrise Highway narrows down in Patchogue, now it actually opens up, but it's a long time ago. Suddenly the car just died out, so I rolled into a gas station. I said to this guy, listen, I, you know, I work for Mercedes, take a look at this thing, tell me what, you know, hoping that it was just something simple. He says, you're not gonna believe this. He said, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but the pressure in your crankcase blew everything backwards. All the oil was burned through your carburetor. He said, this engine is seized. I said, seized? So at work, we have what they call the unit shop. There were these little German men that walked around. <laughs> True story, every one of them had a German accent. And all they did was rebuild whole engines, both you know, for passenger cars, and they, the dealership was owned by a former Porsche race car driver and the pit crew chief. So they had these little German tinkerers in there they would not only build cars for normal people, but they built racing engines for Mercedes. So these are the guys, you're gonna take your car to anybody, these are the guys you take it to. They looked at the car, they said, oh, the engine is seized. $12,000 they wanted for an engine. Now this was, this was in the mid 80s. $12,000, you can almost buy a house. <laughs> so the car wound up rolled into my garage. The car sat there for, I don't know, a year or whatever it was. And we were in a service, and we left that service so cranked up, believing God that he could do anything. Amen. We got home, I called this, there was a place in town, there was a woman named Rosa. She's now gone home to be with the Lord. Rosa was four feet high and four feet round. She was huge, Rosa. And Rosa, I had this, this shop where all she worked on were imports, but a lot of high-end stuff. Lamborghinis and Ferraris and all this kind of stuff. So I called her, I said, listen, I got this Mercedes and the engine is seized. Who said it's seized? I said, Mercedes, you give Rosa that car. I said, okay. She takes the car, she calls me to, like the next day, or two day, whatever it was. She says, you come pick up your car. I said, couldn't fix it? She says, it runs fine. She said, I put a new battery in it. She said, but other than that, it runs fine. You see, we believed beyond the limitations of normal thinking, okay? You know, we've, we live much more of our lives with carnal thinking than we did with spiritual thinking. I only got saved in my mid-30s. Uh, mid so I had lots of years in the world. So I still had stinking thinking that had to be gradually renewed. We took a step of faith. We said, God can heal our car. We laid hands on the car. We went out in the garage, we laid hands on the car, and Rosa came, takes the car. Rosa did what the little German tinkers couldn't do. And it cost me a tow and a battery. And I drove the car for years and sold it to a Jehovah Witness. Yeah, praise God. It had a scripture across the back window, and I thought for sure she'd take it off. She didn't. I saw the car in the shopping center a long time later, and it still had, still had the uh, scripture on it. Why did I share that with you? Because we've got to take limitations off of God. We've got to stop doing it. We, we've got to stop thinking that that's impossible. Because with faith, nothing is impossible. Nothing. I I got COVID in April of 2020. I felt like I was run over by a truck. I tried to see my doctor. He was nowhere to be found. The doctors, they were hiding. So my insurance company said, call us Teladoc. I said, okay. So I called Teladoc. You, you see Teladoc on your iPad. And on comes this nice young doctor. And he says, so tell me your symptoms. So I tell him, he says, you have COVID. He said, but I won't send you to a hospital because you might not come home. Hospitals were really having a hard time at that point. 
two days. He gave me a prescription. In two days, every symptom was gone. In two days. The body count at that point was ridiculous. I mean, you were lucky to survive it. Two days later, I was walking around the house fine. Not a symptom left. Because we we let God out of the box. We, 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 we really work hard at removing the limitations from God. He said all we have to do is believe. He'll do the heavy lifting. Amen. So why do we struggle with this? Because we don't want to surrender. You know, there's a danger to some people. I'm, I'm going to get to it. Hebrews 11 and 1 says this in the Passion Translation. I love this. Back to what we believe creating what we see. Hebrews 11 1 of the Passion says, Now faith brings our hopes into reality Amen. and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. Just because you don't yet see it doesn't mean you don't got it. I know there's a terrible English. Maybe someone will pay attention. It's not, we can't go by what we see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Listen, doubt and unbelief will strip you of the very power that the Word of God is intending to provide. Uh, listen to these revealing scriptures. In Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 11 in the Passion, it says, Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you'll be protected as you fight against the strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings. This is, this is a very good description. This, uh, this is an eye-opener. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's the battle that we, we fight with the enemy. You know, it's not one of these long-distance fire or cruise missile kind of things. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat. You're fighting for your life. It's not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods. I love the way that's worded. Small d. Demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear the armor. Huh? You got to wear it. Amen. You got to wear all the armor that God provides so that you're protected as you confront the slanderer. That's another thing. We, we've got to confront him yeah. instead of constantly being on the defensive. For you, listen, for you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. Amen. You will rise Amen. victorious. Put on Amen. truth. As a belt to strengthen you as you stand in triumph. Put on holiness as a protective armor that covers your heart. Stand on your feet alert. Then you'll always be ready to share the blessings of peace. In every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield. Oh, don't you love it? Faith is a wraparound shield. Yes, hallelujah. For it's able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies and take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. Hallelujah. Friends, we're told to take the sword. It's not going to jump into your hand. You've got to take it. And keep in mind now that 
that sword is the only offensive weapon that you've got. Every other piece of armor, of God's own armor, is defensive. I don't want to be in a position where I've got to rely upon anything in particular to, to save me, physically, spiritually, or any other way, when I've got the Word of God. Amen. And, and the King James calls it the sword of the Spirit. You see, it's the sword of the Spirit when you allow the Spirit to wield the sword on your behalf. Amen. Then it's happening with in his power, in his authority. This sword of the spirit is the only thing that we have to slay those forces of darkness. Unless you're an unbelieving believer. <laughs> you see a sword left in its scabbard you know what a scabbard is, right? It's a, like the sheath that the sword is carried in. A sword that's left in its scabbard can injure no one. Hmm? What this will do is make a real easy battle for the enemy. How easy to beat someone that doesn't fight back. Because you don't believe that the sword is going to work. If you don't speak the word of God, then you're leaving your most powerful weapon in its scabbard. Mm -hmm. You might be equipped offensively, but you're empty-handed offensively. Friends, the word says we have to take the sword. We've got to draw it out. We've got to pick it up. And we've got to go to battle with it. The word tells us where to confront the enemy. What, what did David do with Goliath? He ran at him. Can you imagine? This nine foot of whatever he was, beast, had to have looked at this kid like a, a kamikaze pilot. He ran at him. He, he was confident. He was sure. Amen. He drew upon his past victories. He said, wait a minute. I remember that time when that bear came. And I remember when that lion came. And, and all I had were my bare hands. And God saved me. God spared me. God killed this thing on my behalf. Amen. He says that he's going to do the same thing to this uncircumcised Philistine. Hallelujah. And off he went on this kamikaze mission. Ah! <laughs> and And... What happened is exactly what he said. He said, I'm going to cut his head off. And he did, with his own sword. He stood. You know, that's the thing. A lot of people think that Goliath died when he got hit with the stone. No, he didn't. He got knocked out when he got hit with the stone. He fell to the ground. You got to read it. David stood on his chest, took his own sword, and chopped his head off with it. Then he carried the head around town to make sure everybody knew that this guy was a loser. We need that mentality that, that when we believe, nothing is impossible. Amen. No devil is too big. No problem is too great. If God is for you, who or what could be against Amen. you? The apostle, in those verses that I shared with you from Ephesians, he used the term put on a number of times. He said, put on the armor. Take up the sword. You see, without taking possession and using the weaponry, it's useless to us. Friends, when it comes down to the real subject of tonight's message, the unbelieving believers, I, I, I think of the difference in qualities of furniture. You see, some furniture looks great. It looks beautiful. It looks like real high-quality stuff. But all it has is a veneer on the outside. A very, very thin layer, like paper, of good, fancy wood. But behind that veneer, 
who knows what's in there. But then on the other hand, there's solid wood. You see, you get what you pay for. Amen? With, with solid wood, you know that what's on the outside is going to be on the backside too and everything in between. We, we've got to stop falling for appearances. Hmm? The enemy is a deceiver. He'll put on a face. He'll put on a mask. He'll, he'll put on an appearance. I mean, the word says that, that he comes as an angel of light. How many times have we been deceived? It's got to stop. We've got to stop being unbelieving believers. We've got to trust in every syllable written between the covers of your Bible. Amen. Friends, what I'm, what I'm not saying tonight is that this kind of deception is intentional. None of us intentionally deceive ourselves or allow ourselves to be unbelieving believers. That's not the point. You see, things happen. Things happen that can and will undermine our faith. That, that, that'll spoil the seed that's been sown in our heart to try to keep it from ever producing its destiny within you. If you're aware of it, you can better defend against it. Amen? Does that make sense? Amen. I want to share this with you from Matthew. Matthew 13. The beginning in 18. It says, Now, listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Verse 20 says, The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. 22 says, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. <laughs> Lastly, in verse 23, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Amen. God's heart for you is that you be good ground, producing. He's sent his word to bless you. He, he has his word being sown into your hearts so that you become fruitful in every area of your life. Friends, they all heard the word. That, that's what they all have in common. They all heard the word. But for various reasons, 75% of them ended up unbelieving believers. In some cases, through no fault of their own. Listen, it's not your fault if someone's preaching a message and the guy's a bore. You're sitting there trying to hear what he has to say and receive the word, and you're like, with the, all the people around you. You're not going to walk away having received the real essence of that word. Not understanding the word of God is, is frustrating the word. Huh? Listen, over the years, we've seen many powerful truths challenged by some believers, even by some pastors, because the, the real truth 
would probably reveal their flawed faith. But if they oppose the truth and then it fails to perform, which is what's going to happen because if you don't believe it, you're not going to receive it. Then they'll appear to be right. See, I told you it wasn't going to work. Of course it's not going to work. You're faithless. Listen, we've got to be careful. We can't allow ourselves to receive from anybody that comes along that tells you they, they heard from God. You better take what they say and be a Berean with it. I don't know if you ever heard of the Bereans. Nobody could tell a Berean anything without them going to the Word and confirming that it was accurate. We've got to really scrutinize the Word of God. There are a million. Turn on Facebook. Any one of those things. Instagram, any of them. There is no shortage of yappity, yap, yap, yap. I don't know how much of it is truth, but I'll tell you one thing. This church might have a handful of people in it, but you're always going to hear the truth. Because Amen. everything that I share up here is straight out of that book. I don't embellish stuff. I mean, sometimes to make a point, but I don't tell you what I believe. I believe. It, it, you're not here to hear my doctrine. You're here to hear Jesus' doctrine. Amen? Amen. Listen. The word of God never fails. Mm -hmm. But the, the faith of men does. Are, are you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Many over the years have disputed, even opposed the faith message. They've opposed the grace, grace message, the, the kingdom message. Many have challenged or dismissed healing deliverance, prosperity, miracles, and more. Meanwhile, it's all Bible truth. These are kingdom principles. So, so what does that leave? <laughs> it leaves a, a church full of empty heads and hearts for a faithless preacher or pastor to preach to. You see, if people don't know better, you can tell them anything. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you've got a church full of empty hearts and heads, and I'm, I, you, you can't blame the people for that. They can have what they've been taught. In a place like that, let me tell you, there are, there, there are no challenges there. There's no need to step out of any planes there. huh? Like, like the person that wants to be the, the skydiver but can't get out the door. There, there's, no, there's no challenges like that there. You know why? They, they, they'll never need a parachute because that plane's never leaving the ground. They'll preach a safe watered down message that'll never test anything but the tolerance of the hearers. I didn't come here to bash churches tonight. We are a church. But I get so frustrated sometimes when I hear the stuff that's being preached. It has no teeth. Some of the stuff I hear being preached, the only one that's being blessed is the guy that's talking. Not the people that are hearing it. Something's wrong there. I remember for, for years there, there was a, a term going around for these churches that were like booming with size, and they were called seeker friendly churches. Where, and, and listen, you know, far be it for me to criticize a guy that's got, you know, 20,000 people at his church when we got 20. But, but I know this. I know that when the time comes that I stand before God, I'm going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because I, I don't go by the number of empty seats or the number of full seats. Amen? I, in my heart, I believe, I fully believe that as long as we're doing the king's work, as long as we're trying to populate the kingdom, 
the king will populate the church. Amen? It doesn't matter how many people are here. I mean, last week we had like, you know, more than twice this number. But it's, it's almost New Year's. I mean, you know, we don't want to we don't want to break the trend here, you know? But I'm going to tell you this. If you came seeking, what does the word say is going to happen? You're going to find. If you come knocking, he's going to open that door to you. This is what faith is all about. It's, it's going after God. It's pursuing God. And then it's expecting him to, to do exactly what he said he would do. Amen. Church, where God isn't expected to perform his word, in all likelihood, his word won't be performed. Does that make sense to you? It's time to turn the tables, church. It's time to turn the tables on compromise and on unbelief. And it's time that we take a stand, stand firmly on God's word, immovable, fearless, and expectant. We've got to trust God and not doubt. Hallelujah. God shows himself most powerfully in the situations that seem most impossible. Because then you can scratch your head all you want. The only way it could have happened was by God. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's things in this life we can't do anything about. There are situations that have come up that you're powerless to do anything about. But God's never powerless. If God is for you, who could be against you? I'm going to close with these interesting words that I found. There's a little article I read while I was preparing this message. And in it, it says, did you ever have a teenager explain your phone to you? <laughs> I guarantee you it won't be long before you say, I didn't know that. The truth is that modern mobile phones have monstrous capabilities that most of us never tap. But guess what? God also has monstrous capabilities that most of us never tap. The trouble is that we are unbelieving believers to one degree or another, and our unbelief ties the hands of God. Friends, it's time that we cut his hands loose. It's time. It's time that we free God to be God. Shambach used to sing a song. I still see at, at the church we came out of. I can still see him. He called it boot scooting across the altar, singing, let God be God. <laughs> he was great. R.W. Shambach. Let God be God. We've got to let God be God. We, we, we've got to take off the restraints of, of unbelief. We've we, we, we got to get ready to, to jump from those planes. Amen? Our, our, our course in, in skydiving is over. It's time now that we become what we're destined to be. And I say that figuratively. Don't any of you jump out of a plane and say he told me to. Friends, our trust must overcome our fear. Our trust in God's word must overcome our apprehensions. Amen? Has to overcome our doubts. Our trust in God's word has to overcome our unbelief. God's word doesn't require, listen, this is important. God's word doesn't require your understanding or validation to be true. Would you all stand with me? Let's close. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, I don't know about you, but I really want to step it up in 2022. 
Things have got to change. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not settling for the way things are. I'll, I'll only settle when I begin to see things as God destined them to be. I don't believe that we're living in God's best yet. But I believe that by faith, we can apprehend that. Let's surrender and trust God as never before yes, as we go into 2022. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night. Lord, I thank you for each of these, your faithful children. God, they love you. You're their hope. You're the, the fulfiller of their dreams, Father. Lord, I pray that this night you touch each of them in a very, very special way. Lord, to encourage them to believe. Lord, that as it says of, of Abraham, who against all hope believed in hope. Father, I pray that your faithful ones here this night, those watching wherever in the world on Facebook or YouTube, Lord, I pray that they can have that faith of Abraham. And regardless of what they see, against all hope, Lord, may they believe in hope. That means believe expecting. Lord, I thank you that their expectations come to pass. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, Amen. 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 God bless you, Amy. God bless you. Uh, we're going to receive an offering for the work of the Lord before we leave.